Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, your guide to navigating the decentralized web. I'm your host for today's show, Aaron Stanley. In this episode, I'm joined by Paul Puey, CEO of Edge. We talk about Paul's career as an entrepreneur in the Bitcoin space, the lofty aspirations of decentralization, and the importance of useful non-custodial wallet solutions when onboarding new users. Great to have you here, Paul. Hey, thanks for having me. Excited to be on the show. Looking forward to this chat. Amazing, amazing. Um, yeah, looking forward to this. Uh, I always love chatting with guys who've just been in the Bitcoin ecosystem since the early days. Um, I feel like I'm talking, uh, you know, I'm talking to like a like a World War II veteran or something, someone with <laughs> like giants who have gone before us in battle, kind of thing. So I, I'm, I have a lot of reverence for these types of conversations. So I uh, really appreciate you being here. Uh, would love for you to maybe just give a quick introduction uh, to yourself and uh, kind of your your journey into the the world of of Bitcoin, crypto, decentralization. Well, thanks probably for the a, introduction. Probably a very long probably a, reverence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not too long. Uh, thanks for the reverence as a World War II vet. Um, I guess I should be proud that I've survived um, <laughs> where I presume many others haven't survived and have either fallen off the industry or actually man, taken their gains and run and uh, kind of exited like supporting the space. That's fair as well, right? It's, it is an exhausting industry, I admit. Um, and uh, with that, yeah, I've been in the industry since about 2013. Um, that's the year I discovered Bitcoin, and it completed a lot of my ideology um, from really at the root of a lot of the ideology I had um, before getting into finance with with crypto and Bitcoin, um, had the ideology of the largest institutions in our world, whether they be big companies or governments, by and large, mislead us in every facet of our life. Um, early on, it was around the health and wellness space. Um, that's kind of an industry I worked in. I was actually a, a manager at a gym prior to working at Edge. Although prior to that, I was in technology. So I kind of went full circle. Started as a technology guy, went into small business. Um, that's where I actually started to really appreciate things like uh, payment systems, or at least what we could mm. do to fix them, um, was through my time in small business. Uh, but having discovered Bitcoin and said, oh my God, this is a technology that can disrupt the largest entities in our world, the ones that control the narrative and control what we think and believe um, and mislead us. And that's when I went full, full, not full circle, but I deep dove into the deep end and said, I'm you know, quitting the job that I had at the time. And admittedly for the past, for the last three months of that prior job, I was probably not the best employee just because I was listening to the podcast, reading blog articles, news, um, news snippets, anything I could to learn as much as I can about Bitcoin. At the time it was just Bitcoin. Um, but quickly after using Bitcoin, and I'm a big proponent of utility, like I want cryptocurrency to be used. Um, but after using it, I realized there were some key pain points. And that's when I and a few others in the Bitcoin meetup community came together and founded at the time a company called Airbits, which was focused on payments in the space. Um, we pivoted since then into focusing more on exchange and financial services functionality. And that's what people know today as Edge. You know, allowing people to buy, sell, and trade but with a core focus on keeping them in a more decentralized, self-sovereign, autonomous, and more private um, platform than where people were going. And so that's a trend that we felt disheartened by is that, oh, there's this great, you know, decentralized, autonomous technology that everyone just used within effectively a bank, you know, and centralized exchanges. So we wanted to build an alternative that felt like uh, a centralized service but gave people the privacy and autonomy that they get with true cryptocurrency and true utility of crypto. And that's what we have today with, uh, with edge. And so glad to be here. Glad to survive the world war ones, twos. And sometimes I feel like there's, there's a war every, every bull market. So maybe even three uh, and to continue, continue delivering to, to the masses and bring this thing mainstream and mainstream the right way, which is where people own their own funds. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, I always have a great deal of respect for people that that have kind of come out of the early years of of Bitcoin. I mean, I I, I first found Bitcoin in 2013 myself as a reporter, actually. Same class. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I wasn't actually using it; I was just trying to learn about it, I guess. But um, I I I remember I was I was I had a, I was working at the Financial Times at the time, and I was I was asked to do the story about Bitcoin. Actually, I had a friend of mine who was the uh, like worked in communications at the Bitcoin Foundation. The, the short-lived oh, wow. Bitcoin Foundation. And she was like, hey, you should write a story about Bitcoin. And I was like, oh, I've, I've heard of this before. I should I should take a look at this. Um, and it was just like finding information was just 
like I was just remember just like Googling and like, you know, like, like, how do you even find information about like what this actually is? You're going on to like these weird, like kind of chat rooms and like, let's talk Bitcoin and, and, you know, that was a great podcast. Bitcoin that podcast. Talk. It was but like Adam Levine. That was what I learned most. Adam Levine, Andreas Antonopoulos, who I'm surprised is just not a name anymore. Like, you know, most people don't yeah. know who he is, but he was like the biggest name in Bitcoin. Yeah. He, he was sort of like 2020. Sort of like demigod like status, you know, like absolutely. Uh, it was like, oh my gosh, Andreas. But, uh, but I think to your earlier point, a lot of these, these OG guys have just kind of, you know, they've either, they've just kind of walked away like, okay, I'm like, I've, I've contributed my part or they've kind of mm-hmm. scaled back their, their involvement or, yeah. you know, some of these guys, unfortunately, I think just have like PTSD from all the, you know, the, the block size wars and just all the battling and, you know, some of the, you know, the, the maximalism and all these kind of things that, that I've kind of, I know uh, I do to some degree, <laughs> right. that was one of the toughest wars. That was world war two right there for sure. Right, right, right. Well, yeah, and that, and that was I, I. I first so I wrote my first articles about Bitcoin in 2013, and I stopped paying attention for a couple of years because after Mount Gox and Silk Road, it just felt like everything was kind of the 2015 it, crash was hard. It didn't. It didn't feel like there was much of a future there. I guess as an out, as a you know outsider looking in, and then um, little did I know that it would come back again in you know 2016, 2017. Uh, but during those years, it was really just you know, the guns were kind of just turned internally, like, you know, just the big blockers and small blockers just duking it out with each other. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing for like really an outsider to come in and really like you, you look into this and you're like, Oh, it's just these people fighting each other. Like what's, what's their, what's their value? Not fun times, definitely not fun times. And there's still remnants of that today, which is unfortunate, but, um, you know, I think at this point communities have gone their different ways and are just building independently, which is entirely fine. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we'll, to what would you attribute maybe the current breed of like Bitcoin maximalism? Cause it, it's, it strikes me that there's like a lot of these guys that you see on Twitter and kind of like the Bitcoin magazine, you know, Bitcoin conference crowd, like a lot of these guys weren't actually around like during the early days or even the block size wars. It seems like a lot of these people, like the people that are like, you know, canceling Nick Carter and all this kind of stuff. I mean, right. do you, I mean, I'm just kind of curious as a year, I mean, as someone who's been, you know, been in this for 10 years now and you've, you've seen various evolutions of kind of Bitcoin community divisions and realigning and I mean, to what, to what do you, do you attribute um, maybe kind of like, how would you kind of describe like the current state of, you know, the, of like Bitcoin maximalism, I guess. Would be you know, question. it's funny because I'm definitely not a Bitcoin maximalist, although, you know, a lot of my personal values in Bitcoin, I still believe in Bitcoin. Um, and we still make efforts in developing in, in, in the Bitcoin ecosystem and advancing a lot of its, uh, its initiatives. But um, I, I can't blame Maxis in a way because the crypto ecosystem has blown up and it's become so large that it's really hard to absorb and understand all of it. It's hard to understand the value proposition of every coin, chain, token, you know, what they would call shit coins. It's really hard to filter. And at some point, it's really easy to just go, I'm just Bitcoin, right? All of these other things are scams is what um, kind of the average maxi would say. And you, you know, just kind of throw out the baby with the bathwater as they say, and you forget and you, you not so much miss out on because obviously Bitcoin does well, but you exclude what are legitimate, fascinating, compelling projects, i.e. Filecoin, you know, Ethereum, um, uh, Web3 projects as a whole that do have a very compelling future for them. You just like, it's just too complicated. It's, uh, there's too many other scams. So I think because the noise, the signal to noise ratio is so bad, mm. um, especially in the bull runs In the bull runs, the signal yeah. noise ratio is just unbearable. Um, for the average person, it just simplifies your life to just go, you know, Bitcoin, right? It's been around the longest. It's not going away. There's a lot of big names that back it, big companies that back it. Um, and it's, it's a simpler way of living. Um, it's a simpler way of thinking about the value proposition of supporting crypto as a whole. So I don't blame them in that regard. Um, I think it's when they start going very, very publicly hating everything else. Um, like that's the mission is just to just crap on everything else that, you know, I, then then you're spending time better, um, uh, that is better suited to just you know, like doing some work, do some work that you like as opposed to um, going and just crapping on other projects. Um, but I think, you know, as a whole, that is kind of my, my assessment of the state of Bitcoin max maximalism is the fact that signal noise is really bad and it's just a lot simpler. Yeah. Yeah. I I think it's, it's a lot easier to, um, you know, I think we do live in a world where people are incentivized to just engagement farm or clout farm on Twitter. And it is easier to, 
just kind of take this stand where I'm I'm pro Bitcoin and I'm anti shitcoin and that's just going to be me and I'm going to yeah. go in it you know and that you're going to get a lot of engagement you're going to get a lot of followers by doing that right uh, you'll get simple a lot of enemies too. Minds think too. alike. <laughs> yeah, like you'll <laughs> and so hate to say it, but it takes a simple mind to say that and it takes a fairly simple mind to follow it and so yeah. not to insult those people. Um, because I, I look at it this way. It's not like a simple mind is an insult. It's just that you'd rather focus a larger percentage of your brain on something else in your life, right? If someone wants to focus, you know, 90% of their brain on cryptocurrency, then, you know, being just pure Bitcoin is probably not a great use. Instead, analyze other things, such, you know, like the Nick Carters would, right? They'd like get, they're using a lot of their brain and hence analyzing a lot of different projects and looking at them very, very deeply. Um, if you've only got a small slice of your of your brain available because you've got kids to take care of, work, you know, bills to pay, blah blah blah, then I could see why people would just narrow down and go, okay, Bitcoin, right? So simple mind relative to how much you can spend in an ecosystem as large as crypto will cause a lot of people to just go down the Bitcoin route. And then um, maybe maybe we'll we'll address your shirt here uh, with your clever with your clever logo or anti fiat crypto club, which uh, I, I applaud that. Um, <laughs> And I mean, just think, just I would just be interested in your reflections ten years in to the into the Bitcoin ecosystem, and um, you know we we've seen, you know, narratives come and go about Bitcoin as you know as a new payment system. We've seen you know the Lightning Network is going to come and it's going to transform. We've seen you know all the all the scaling stuff. We've seen all these kind of newer arguments about Bitcoin as a new store of value, as an inflation hedge, as as you know, and uh, as basically you know. You buy Bitcoin as protection against, you know, just unlimited money printing. We've seen waves of unlimited money printing and now inflation to as sort of the consequence of that. And I'd just be interested in your reflections on, I mean, you seem like a pretty like rational Bitcoiner. So I'd just be interested in like your honest like reflections on like, has this experiment succeeded? Has it like with, withheld the stress test, do you think, uh, uh, that were, that were, you know, 10, 10 years on? Is this, is this, you know, would you have... Are, are, have we maybe made the progress that you thought we would have made like 10 years ago? Gosh, looking back 10 years, um, we've both gone where I never thought we would go and not gotten to where I thought we'd be way past. <laughs> and I think that's a common thread if you ask many people who have been in the space for even five years. Um, you know, we founded the company. Our focus was on, hey, let's use Bitcoin. Let's, let's make it a currency that is used globally where I will be able to use Bitcoin wherever I travel. I will no longer go to a currency exchange house or have to swipe a credit card and know like what's the exchange rate between dollars and euro and whatnot and pesos um and that is so far from having actually happened um hence one of the reasons why we had pivoted the company it's like hey payment as a payment method is just not there um and i think the uh eye-opening thing was that um yeah people care a lot about the volatility of the money that they use for payments um even if you could you know swap into a cryptocurrency and then pay with it fairly seamlessly people still don't like dealing with the fact that they're paying for a five dollar coffee with a currency that's not denoted in dollars and they're having to mentally know well, how much am i losing and then of course it could go up in value and so therefore i'd rather just hold it get rid of my more worthless fiat right so um i think that was a, a realization come 2016 ish time frame 2015 time frame for us as as a um a company and realizing that it's still a speculative asset. And there's still some utility behind it being a speculative asset, but it is primarily a speculative asset. And it's, you know, to kind of put fuel to the fire of, well, it's a speculative asset. Definitely what you mentioned as being like World War II, the block size wars, put huge fuel to that fire because it became hard for it to be a payment method. Um, people couldn't transact it easily. It was primarily held on exchanges. It became the store of value because, well, as a store of value, it, by and large means that you're not going to move it much. You move it a little bit, but you're not going to move it a whole lot. It's, it's not going to have um, a whole lot of velocity, as they say, like velocity of money. Um, and that's fair for now. Um, obviously, developments such as the Light Network are aimed to change that. Um, but it's it's been a long road. I, I initially heard of the Lightning Network in 2015 when it was first, when, when the presentation, or the first presentation was given um, in a San Francisco Bitcoin meetup. And I remember being one of the first people in the room going, wow, this is really compelling. I was excited about it. Um, and it still took multi, multiple years later before it went into anything close to, you know, release candidate ready. So it was a long road coming with still a lot of hurdles. 
and I know is one of the most hated people in Bitcoin for giving it um, a lot of criticism uh, from the viewpoint of the user experience, like what the user experience of Lightning would be like. Uh, like a lot of Bitcoin Maxis to the day absolutely hate me for saying that the user experience would be kind of like an altcoin. That's kind of like, I was famous <laughs> for saying that, you know, and they said, oh, the, this guy just called Lightning an altcoin. I'm like, oh, okay, well, you know, you, you know, you can't take just Bitcoin that you have in mainnet and then send it out on Lightning. You have to like open a channel, blah, blah, blah. And some of those things have got a lot better, you know, and what I spoke about was what the way at the current state of the network, um, uh, not knowing what would happen in the future, because you never know, but that current state of the network was, was years in, like it hadn't changed much years in. And admittedly, some of the best lightning, uh, protocol apps were ones that kind of cheated the, the benefits of lightning. They went fully centralized or they didn't really give you the fees, the fee benefits of, of, uh, of lightning. But I think things are, are improving and it's one of the features that we're looking at, you know, very likely integrating into edge as well. So that ironically, not so much that people could pay so that they, people can get faster swaps. Like people are looking to trade Bitcoin in a much more decentralized manner, a uh, more autonomous manner. Um, and the DEX is available or, or even the centralized CFI swap exchanges still require waiting for a confirmation or two of Bitcoin. When you receive that and you want to get say dollar-based stable coin, if we can make that a lot faster, that's one less reason people have to use a fully centralized exchange. And that's kind of our mission. And if Lightning can help with that, then perfect. You know, uh, we're on it. Um, but we'll be very, very conscious of some of the weird corner cases of Lightning, such as receiving Lightning when you don't have a, you know, any inbound liquidity. What happens there? What kind of fees are, are you going to incur? How long will your, your channel be open before it suddenly gets closed and suddenly you have to pay a larger fee to send out that Bitcoin? So there's a lot of nuance that I think is really tricky. Um, not saying unsolvable, but um, it's it's definitely been a challenge to try to present that to someone who's just used to um, standard on-chain transactions or even the, the the traditional finance world. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think that you know some of these the user experience has gotten you know fairly easy with some of these apps that are really kind of more focused on Lightning. I think like Wallet of Satoshi right. is one. Where you can kind fully of send centralized. fully centralized, yeah. So fully it's centralized. obvious. It's so it's like it's a way where you can oh you can send you know ten sats back and forth, uh, but it's yeah at the same time it's it's you're you're kind of it's it, yeah it's not checking the boxes of like decentralization right like it's yeah, it's so. basically it's it's kind of a gimmick that kind of shows the utility of Bitcoin like hey this goes back and forth but yeah. are we really doing this like in a say- way that's I like sorry, to say, I look, I use the metric, not as this decentralized or not, but is it checking the boxes of the end goal of why we built cryptocurrency, hmm. right? If we built it such that, you know, someone wouldn't be able to take our money, right? We own our money. The wall of Satoshi fails. Right. Um, if we built it such that um, someone can't censor my ability to send the money, you know, even if I own the money, can they stop me from sending it? Well, then we fail the wall of, of Satoshi. Um, you know, then the question is, um, has lightning succeeded from the viewpoint of, will someone be able to stop me from sending my money? Even if I own my money, you know, could they stop me from saying it to a certain person, even though they can't steal it from me? You know, so it's like the censorship resistance versus the ownership, like financial ownership of the funds. Um, and so that's the thing, like to use the word, is it decentralized? I've given up on that word because it, it Mm. has, it doesn't have, it doesn't have an end result meaning in and of itself, right? It's kind of a cool buzzword. Um, yeah, I, I, sorry. Cause this is the decentralized web. <laughs> you know? uh, hey, um, we're, we're open to guess. constructive criticism. So, um, but yeah, but, but the decentralized web obviously has an end goal, right? And I think it's, what is that end goal? Not, is it decentralized? And so, uh, that's the, the conversation I think we should be having. Um, and that what we should be asking of each of these projects, a, a key point example was of one was, uh, there was a, a tweet about Thorchain recently. And that's a project that we strongly promote. We believe, you know, it's, it's an exciting project that lets cross-chain exchanges occur without a centralized institution, right? So this is true cross-chain, not token-based. And um, it was not discovered because it was well-known, but someone had criticized, hey, look, you can, you can see every single swap. When someone goes Bitcoin to Ethereum, you know the source addresses that wanted to swap into exactly how much Ethereum and the destination address. And they said, you know, this project is not about privacy. In some ways, this project is much more transparent than what you would get if you went through a centralized exchange to do that swap. And then people criticize it like, oh my God, how could they be touting privacy and this and that when, you know, it's all publicly available. We go, well, that's not the goal. Well, that that wasn't the goal of the project. 
you know, and so you have to realize what were the goals and are they accomplishing those goals and privacy, at least on chain privacy, isn't one of those things. So the same thing with any other aspect of the decentralized web, what are you trying to achieve? Um, and are you getting there with how it was implemented? Yeah, it, it, it's one of these things where you have to kind of pick your priorities, right? Where, where there's pri like, if you're, pr if you're optimizing for, pr for privacy, like you're gonna have to take one, that's one set of decisions that go into your product. If you're optimizing for, uh, you know, seamless sort of, uh, intermediary free cross chain transfers, that's a whole nother product stack, right? Yeah. That, that's, and, and I, and I do think with a lot of these web three protocols, with a lot of these products and primitives, like just having the level of privacy that, you know, the privacy is going to have to come later at some point, like you got to build the thing first before you can really implement the privacy in, in a lot of these, in a lot of these cases, I feel. Um, yeah, I do find it. I mean, it's definitely I, been tough. And then even just going back to your, your critique of wallet of Satoshi, like I, I find it kind of funny that, uh, Satoshi himself probably would not approve of using it, uh, <laughs> given name. the way you, the way you described it. So yeah, perhaps yeah. it's a bit of a, it's probably not Satoshi's wallet. <laughs> yeah. It's probably not the one he's using today if he's still around, I guess. Um, yep. but it is useful. I mean, I showed, I, I use, I showed that to my wife, like I was showing, I was sending her some Satoshis and stuff and she's like, wow, it's so cool. Yeah. Uh, but, but it's a way, it's a nice way to kind of, you know, show people, but yeah, I, it, it's, it's not really the, um, you know, there's, there's some limitations there, I guess. Limitations. Uh, and, and I hate to mislead people because if they get used to that, if they get used to like, oh, it's just that simple, it's that easy. Um, and they introduce it to someone that needs the actual benefits of crypto, someone that might be in a jurisdiction that might be a bit oppressed and they may have, um, some rulers that don't want you being able to receive and send money across borders. And then they use something like a wall of Satoshi and then that gets, them um, effectively blocked, uh, yeah. censored, or f worst case, funds removed. Then it's like, well, what happened? What was this promise? What was the autonomy? point? Right? Yeah, that you, that this cryptocurrency is supposed to give because this happened to me with PayPal. Now it's happening with me to me with Bitcoin. So I think that's the challenge I have is a lot of people say that it's like, oh, well, it's just a great little like first nugget, and then we teach them to actually hold their own keys later. Um, but it generally doesn't work that way. Um, mm. humans don't think that way. They, they usually like, oh, this is the easy thing. Well, that's what I expect the product and the industry to be. Usually it starts off hard and as it gets easier, you adopt it. You don't start easy and then get harder, mm. right? Like, what, what kind of products start easy and then you're told to use the harder thing over time. Yeah. I, I can't think of this, uh, of an example of that ever. Technology has worked in the opposite direction where, you know, your Apple II required you to insert a floppy disk and type some commands in order to, to load a game. Um, and then your Mac didn't, you click an icon, it got easier. Um, installing the internet was a big pain in the ass, you know, 20 plus years ago, you have to actually install your, your drivers on your windows box. And then it, you turn on your computer and it works today. So, um, going from easy to hard in the name of ideology hasn't really been successful, um, at least with respect to technology in the past, at least that I can think of. I'm open to being challenged by that. Someone give me an example, please holler, shoot me a tweet, but otherwise it doesn't ring a bell. So I think we need to start with, um, tools that get easier while retaining the ideology of the harder, like people gain the benefit of the harder, but they just become simpler to use. Yeah, no, that, that's a really good point. And my, my brain is sort of working here processing that what you just what you just said that's a very that's because i've i've been in this camp of like oh if we can kind of just use you know like buying buying bitcoin on you know cash app or on paypal as sort of a gateway drug to get people you know for lack of a better term as you know as a gateway drug to get them interested in in this and then oh once they get a little taste then they move on to buying some other coins and they start thinking about okay how can i custody these coins you know how can i then you kind of train them in like hey if you buy it on paypal it's not actually your coins it's paypal's coins uh, it's only your coins if you can actually withdraw them, uh, which some of these services don't actually allow you to do. I mean, some of them do now. I think PayPal, you can actually withdraw now, but it's some of these good, other ones, yeah. some of these other ones, you can't do it. Like, it's just, it's just a note on a balance sheet that like, oh, like, you know, they could easily just, you know, debit and credit your Bitcoin away if they felt like it. Right. If, if that was, yep. if, if, the, if the, if there was ever a need or a mistake or something. Um, yeah, so fortunately one direction that we have gone and, you know, we were a part of pushing this initiative was the, the narrative that a lot of. Um, Bitcoiners early on would say is like, sure, use the centralized exchange to buy your Bitcoin, um, but immediately withdraw it, right? That was a very common narrative and it still is today. Like, okay, go to, go to Binance, go to Coinbase, go to Kraken, whatnot, but then always withdraw it into whatever wallet, you know, but self-custody. And they'd recommend the two products. The industry has vastly 
improved in the sense that a single self-custody product lets you do that now, right? Where within the same app, you set up you know, your account, secure your keys, and you can then purchase crypto and there's no second step. Mm. That to me is what I call the right direction where, yeah, it's hard at first, but doable and it gets easier and then easier. And with, with every generation of easier, a larger percentage of the population can adopt it. Whereas many people won't bother to do the go buy on Coinbase, copy paste my address, set up a wallet, write down the private key, you know, uh, then copy and paste the address to withdraw um, and then do that every time. And then when I want to sell, it's send the funds over to the centralized exchange, wait three confirmations, then do the trade and then send it to my bank. All that can now be tied into a single app. Um, and I think we were the first to market with that in our original app, Airbits, in like 2015. Mm. Um, but of course, many have followed suit. It's obviously the the logical um, uh, direction that the industry should should go in. And uh, one of the most popular Twitter spaces that I've kind of uh, been listening to the uh, the crypto town hall. You know, Mario and Alfa, I give them you know hats off to to their spaces because it's been very insightful on just like financial crypto and whatnot. But they had mentioned um, like an announcement of of one wallet now offering you know on and off ramp. And he's like, is this the direction? And yes, absolutely. It's definitely the direction of the industry going because it's just that one huge less reason why anyone should have to touch a fully centralized exchange or even have to create an account there, which I think is, uh, that's awesome. That's what I want to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It goes back to the old Andreas Antonopoulos uh, uh, analogy, where he was—he was like, a, you know, a centralized exchange is like a public bathroom. It's like you—you you know, like you go in, you use, you got do what you got to do, and you get out, right? Get all out. <laughs> it's that kind of, and yeah, um, and you probably leave it a little dirtier than when you. Yeah, right yeah, in. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, make sure you wash your hands really good, you know, <laughs> on your way out, right? Um, exactly. And. And, and now maybe, we don't have to use a public bathroom. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. Now, now it's like, you know, now it's just a public sewer system, which right. we use from our own home, <laughs> right. right? So the centralized exchange is still there. And that's true. When people are they're doing on and off ramps um, through a self-custody app, they're still hitting these centralized exchanges. They just don't even realize it, mm. right? That's kind of like the analogy of the public sewer system, but you don't have to touch it. You're in your right. in comfort of your, own, um, of your own home. So on that end, why don't you talk a bit more about how Edge, you know, really meet some of these criteria that we've, we've, we've been kind of dissecting here of some of the, the flaws of the, the various, various models of exchange and custody and, and wallets. And maybe talk about how, I mean, why do you see edge as, as sort of a superior product to some of these things if you, for, for people that are really, um, they want, they, they care about like ease of use. Like, I don't like, I'm not a PhD in computer science. Like, I don't know how to like do all this crazy stuff, but like, I just want to yeah, make it yeah. easy to use. I want something that is Give me safe and secure, and uh, you know it can't just be lost or stolen by some other intermediary that might be involved here in a way that I don't necessarily realize. Yeah, um, this is a, a great segue as well into some of my early inspirations into kind of like decentralized storage. Mm. Um, and so I had used some early um, Bitcoin wallets uh, for those that have been in the space, hopefully at least like five years. I think they were still around five years ago. But like Mycelium was one that I had used, um, Blockchain.info, which is still around today. Um, uh, BRD, uh, which is no longer around, but a lot of them and many of the ones today, such like MetaMask still have the, you know, you write down, you back up your private key. Um, in the early days, it wasn't even that it was, I remember it was so bad. Um, early versions of mycelium required you to take a file that was on your phone or your Android phone. Cause it was an Android only app and save the file, right. <laughs> or print this PDF. And then the screen on your phone would show you like a 16 digit random password. Mm. And then you'd have to write that onto the PDF and a combination of the PDF, which had a QR code on it, plus the password was your private key, right? So you needed to save that. Just getting a PDF from your Android and printed on a printer in itself was a challenge. And this is 2013. <laughs> we didn't have like AirPrint didn't really exist and Google cloud print didn't really exist. So you were like mailing this PDF to yourself, getting it from your Bitcoin wallet to your email app, mailing it checking on your desktop and printing it. It was uh, a world catastrophe. And so private key management was really what fascinated me. How do we make private key management feel like web two? And at the time, web two wasn't a term, web three wasn't a term, but really just give people the familiarity of, I, I just want to create an account and log in. Um, and that's kind of the motive of edge. And the inspiration about uh, from that was kind of um, synchronization of encrypted data. Because at the end of the, end of the day, 
uh, what a lot of people were doing was they were taking private keys, encrypting them, and putting them on some storage, such as their computer, right? But you need to back up your computer because if you lose your keys in your computer, which many people did, you know, there's the legendary wallet.dat file for a lot of people that were in Bitcoin and other early cryptos like Litecoin, Doge, that file had all your private keys and you had to save that thing because if your computer got wiped out, there went all your keys. Mm. Um, so they would encrypt it, put it in some storage. They might even synchronize it to another computer onto the cloud. And if the encryption is solid, then that's fine to put on the cloud because you can't break the encryption the same way you wouldn't be able to break a private key. So they're doing all those manual steps to back up their private key. We said, hmm, we can just bake this into the app, make it automatic. And I remember one, I was a big fan of BitTorrent. You know, and that was, you know, very widely used admittedly for like pirating software, but it was a fascinating protocol because it was peer to peer, meaning that all you needed was just another computer that knew the hash of this content and it would synchronize. You'd be able to find that computer wherever it was on the web and synchronize it. And it would peer to peer replicate it across any computer that had that. So that was one aspect of BitTorrent. Um, the Bit BitTorrent, the company spun off another product, which is still in existence today, called BitTorrent Sync. And the primary difference between BitTorrent and BitTorrent Sync is BitTorrent is much like IPFS. You have a hash of some content, and through that hash, you can find this content wherever it is, whether it's a video, a file, music file, whatever, you know, an actual web page, an image for a web page. Um, but BitTorrent Sync, think of it as more like a peer-to-peer -peer Dropbox, a self-hosted peer-to-peer Dropbox. You have a directory, and the directory has a key. Mm. You, whatever you put in that directory automatically gets synchron encrypted. That's the most important part. It was encrypted and then synchronized to any other devices that also have that key. And that made the concept of, of um, kind of like an IPFS BitTorrent usable for mutable data, you know, data that you actually could change. You know, where a standard BitTorrent and IPFS are very strong for immutable data because it's a hash of the data. Um, this protocol allowed you to have a directory and input files, remove files, edit files, and all of those changes were synchronized. And so that created the motivation to create a wallet app where the keys are stored client side, but automatically synchronized between any, you know, any devices that you have connected, including um, a cloud backup, right? But always encrypted client side. You know, that's what BitTorrent Sync promised. These are always encrypted. Uh, client side before they're ever hitting the cloud or getting stored on the cloud. Um, that was the the heart of what inspired you know our company. It was like, hey, I want to I want to build something where the synchronization is invisible in the background. And we actually pestered you know BitTorrent the company at the time, like, hey, can we get access to this? Can we license it? You know, is it open source? Blah blah. blah. Um, and they just they were non-responsive. Like they just would not respond to email. I think we got one response saying. Um, uh, uh, Please hold on. We'll we'll talk to our our superiors, uh, and that's it. Never responded. And so Justin Sun didn't. Justin yeah. Sun didn't write you back didn't. after uh, <laughs> well, his excellency. At that point, Justin we gave Sun. up. Yeah, this is before <laughs> Justin Sun took over. You know, unfortunately. So he, yeah, never never wrote us back. And so BitTorrent Sync actually spun off into another company um, called Resilio. And so that is a product we still use today, like inside our company, separate from the implementation of of Edge of the app. But we just use it for synchronization of files that we share between different computers. It's a great product, um, but you know, closed source, fully proprietary. There's no you know open source alternative that works as well as that one. Um, but know that that was kind of the inspiration of what we had built. So at the end of the day, what's the user experience of the user in Edge when you launch the app? You don't ever have to see your private key. The private keys are created um, for every single wallet but they're automatically encrypted with the credentials that you use to create an account. And they're automatically backed up and they're automatically synchronized between all your different devices. And that's not just the keys, that's everything that you do inside of the app is encrypted client side. So everything from, hey, I wanna see my cryptocurrency in dollars or in Euro or in pesos, that setting is an encrypted data file that then synchronizes between all the different devices on your um, mm. that you happen to own and, and that have logged into that account as well metadata so i found it frustrating that this is a digital currency yet every time i transacted with someone i have no clue as to what that transaction was it felt like cash like you know i i received five bucks who is this five dollars from um in the physical realm, I get it. That's reason, it's kind of hard to track physical currency, but in the digital realm, it should be easy. So we added a metadata layer where, you know, 
Aaron, if you send me some funds, I can say, Hey, that was, that was Aaron. That was the five bucks paving back for coffee. And that data is also encrypted client side. Nobody can see that other than the end user encrypted, backed up and then synchronized between all the devices that you might use that account with. So privacy of that metadata layer is very important to us. You look at our servers, there's nothing to see, but encrypted data, you don't know what that data is. Mm. Um, so that's a key piece of the compelling part of like, hey, why use Edge? And then kind of a, a corollary to that is the fact that all the keys that are, since we have this encrypted data storage, you don't have to have just one key. So a lot of wallets, you write down your 24 words and that's the only key you have. Otherwise you're having to write down and back up multiple 24 words. Um, because we have that convenience of an encrypted blob bucket every wallet you create in edge in, in an edge account so your bitcoin your ethereum your filecoin you know your matic whatnot all of those are sa actually separate master private keys they're they're not shared key that derives all of your addresses they're each individual now maybe like, well why bother huge reason for that is actually security there have if, if you look back just even the past like three years there have been multiple reports of um, people sharing that key across, multi sharing their one key that holds all their money across different apps. I know Solana wallets had some of these issues where a key they would create in a Solana wallet, they would then put into their multi-asset app and then put Bitcoin into it and Ethereum in it and blah, blah, blah. But they'd want it in the Solana wallet because it had some specific Solana features. But since they've shared it now, any compromise of that key in, for example, the Solana wall, of which there was one that had a major compromise, would now compromise every single asset that that user holds. Um, by having separate keys for each asset, if you happen to transfer it out of edge to use some, you know, whiz bang, you know, vote on some governance feature inside some chain that, you know, we don't support very well, like, you know, we can send and receive and trade, but we can't do voting, that doesn't affect every other asset. Your Bitcoin's not affected, your Ethereum's not affected, you know, just that one key that you pull out. Um, and so that separation is valuable from a security point of view. It's also convenient from an import point of view. So um, if there's some random key you happen to have from MetaMask three years ago, you're like, ah, oh, it's got a few tokens in it and you import it into Edge, it gets encrypted into that same bucket, right? It's really easy to now take in keys from other apps and put them into one encrypted account almost like a password manager, but it's a key manager, right? That's kind of the, the philosophy and try to keep things much easier for people than with traditional apps. And hopefully that kind of summarizes it pretty well, a little bit long-winded, but uh, yeah. we'll give it a try and check it out. Yeah, no, I, 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 I follow where you're coming from on the key management side. And I think that this, some of this stuff is like, on one hand, maybe this is like, you know, excessive detail that most people like don't, it's like a little too like technical for people like really wrap their head around. But on the other hand, it's like this is pretty important stuff, right? Because yeah, um, even just like the having this basically, you know, your segregated keys for each asset in the wallet, not just, not just, you know, having each key derived from your each, the key for each individual asset being derived from the master key for the wallet. Um, have it low, like things like that, I think just really illustrate the level of kind of thought and like precision you've put into this, trying to make this as, as really as secure of a product as possible, right? And so it's like, okay, if one asset is, one key is compromised, like my, my Matic or something is compromised, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything else is going to be compromised as well. So I think those are exactly. like really important things that people, I mean, they probably mean that people need to think about when they're choosing a wallet. Like if they're, if they're really trying to go the full self custody route, these are things they need to be considering, especially if they own Absolutely. like a big portfolio of coins, right? If they're just holding Bitcoin, that's one thing, but if you're holding, if you've got bags of all sorts of other altcoins and things, these are things, uh, this is stuff you need to be considering. Um, and maybe let's go into some of the, you know, some of the other features that you have built in here. And even, even alluding to what you were talking about before with the ability to be able to buy and sell and trade, swap, et cetera, without having to interface with a centralized exchange at all. And um, I mean, just speaking out of personal experience here, my experience using these types of features in, you know, variety of apps uh, or wallets, uh, you know, like MetaMask or Ledger, or um, I think maybe even like Trust Wallet. There's a few of these things I've, I've tried using these these kind of in-wallet, wallet-enabled purchases and, and trades and whatnot. And I've always found them to be, I guess, not ideal. I mean, I just found them to be very impractical in a lot of ways, um, mainly because 
you know, a lot of these guys are using like an integration with one of these, these payment, these payment, these fiat on and off ramp services, these credit card processors, like a simplex or something. Mm -hmm. So a, like half the time, like my credit card doesn't even get approved for the transaction. I'm trying to buy, you know, a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin with my credit. Like it's, it's basically charged. I put in my card, it's charging my card and it gets declined for whatever reason, because it's, you know, it's cryptocurrency and the bank thinks it's money laundering or whatever. Um, and then even if it goes through, like the fee is so it's like, you know, it's an $8 transaction fee to buy like a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin and it's all going to this payment mm -hmm. processor. Right. Yeah. So, yep. you know, I'm looking at this, I'm like, well, you know, I mean, if my option is going to be doing this or just, you know, trying to just, you know, trade on, you know, buy something on Binance where there's, you know, maybe it's, you know, it's like, okay, like I'm going to probably go the centralized route if, if the, you know, just because the, I know it's going to accept my payment and I know it's going to, the fees aren't going to be just like highway robbery. Right. Yep. Um, I mean, those are like, those are just, just, just speaking as from my personal experience, I'm sure there's other, you know, things to take into consideration here, but um, I mean, how, but how do you make this, this, this on and off ramping uh, process, like really secure and actually like usable for people where they, they feel like they're getting value out of it, not just like just getting robbed by, you know, excessive, you know, it feels like one of the things it's like you're going to an ATM at the casino, you know, and it's like, mm -hmm. all right, you take out the money. And it's like, there's a $20 ATM fee you got to pay just for the right to take out the money that you can get, you know, across the street for like, you know, a fraction. Right. This is awesome question. And one that, gosh, we've got years of experience understanding better, which is kind of the payment world, the non-crypto payment world. Obviously the crypto side is easy. You pay a network fee right? That's it. Bitcoin kind of high. If it's not lightning, most other chains low. Ethereum can be kind of high as well. The fiat world is a mystery to the average person. And um, from the viewpoint of speed, fraud, cost, all of those are kind of this weird balancing act. And so, um, and you have to kind of ask that from the viewpoint of where you're located. So, you know, right now, <laughs> from my, I don't want to dox you, but I know you're not currently in the US, Aaron, but I'm going to I'm going to guess that you're based out of the U.S. Um, and if you're based out of the U.S., there are two primary methods that you know people use to interact with kind of financial services, direct bank transfers and credit cards. And because of the personality of the U.S., this is kind of an interesting nuance that I've realized having worked in crypto, the personality of the United States makes fraud very easy in our payment methods. Hmm. See if that makes sense to anyone. All right. The personality of people in the U.S. and of the country as a whole makes fraud very easy in our traditional payment methods. So let's kind of di dissect that statement. Um, the U.S. is probably well agreed to be the technology capital of the world. All right, that's kind of our personality by far. Um, you know, Silicon Valley being rooted here. A lot of the biggest names in crypto uh, and in technology are based here. Uh, what does technology do for us? What is at, at the heart? What is technology? Technology is a means to optimize some aspect of our life, right? Make something that takes an hour, take 10 minutes. What takes 10 minutes, take 10 seconds. It's allowing us to be, to put it in a four letter word, lazy. All right. Um, but that's not a bad thing, right? Lazy just means I don't want to do this. I'd rather do something else. So how does this relate to our payment systems? Our payment systems in the US are lazy in the sense that if you look at the way we pay for things, it's take my money, I'll sue you later, All right? Here is everything you need. Here are my private keys to my money, my credit card number, my bank account, blah, blah, blah. Take the money. If you do something wrong, I'll sue you later. Um, that is our payment method in the US by and large with, with only a few exceptions. Um, that is starkly different to a lot of the developing world. Think Brazil, which I know you're familiar with, where it's, I will give you the money, all right? And you'll give me what I want for that money. And I am i can't take it back. I can't take that money back. Um, you know, if uh, if I gave you that money, there's there's little to no recourse. So it starts to sound a lot like cryptocurrency, right? Where yeah. you push payments, you don't pull payments. So basically we're by and large pull payments because that way, you know, our... Um, our gym membership, our subscription to, you know, whatever magazine, if people still do that anymore, our rent payment, mortgage payment, they're just automatically withdrawn every month. And then it's up to us to then complain later. It's convenience over anything else. 
that's what technology is. That's what the that's what the United States personality is rooted in. And so how does this translate into the whole crypto cost fees fraud? Because it's a pull payment, I freely give my private key to my banking system to a lot of people, my credit card, blah, blah, blah. So therefore, it's widely available on the internet. You can, gra- you can get my banking information very easily on the internet. And so, and credit card information and whatnot. So if I am trying to buy cryptocurrency with a credit card, so are a thousand other people trying to buy cryptocurrency with my credit card. And as a company that is going to send me cryptocurrency for a credit card payment, they want to make absolutely damn, 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 damn sure that it is you, that uh, it's the right person and that they're not trying to be frauded to give you cryptocurrency when really that credit card is not yours, you're going to charge it back. Um, So what is the cost of all of that? It's very expensive. It's very expensive to do all of the checks necessary, the heavy KYC uh, necessary to determine that you really are getting that money. And doing it through a self-custody wallet app, such as Edge and many of you know other similar apps, in comparison to centralized exchange, usually means that you're actually getting the crypto. You're not getting a credit of the crypto the way you would if you went to a Coinbase, where Coinbase says you bought Bitcoin, but you didn't really because you haven't taken it out. All right. Um, and during that time when you haven't taken it out, they are doing everything that they can possibly do to determine that it's really your money and that's really your account and that you haven't frauded them. Um, and that allow that, that suffices some time for them to feel comfortable with then after maybe a week or two, letting you withdraw it, which is why they're able to offer lower fees because at the end of the day, what do fees do? They also allow an exchange to hedge against the fraud that they do receive. So if they're receiving one, 2% fraud, a higher fee then lets them say, well, I can hedge against that. I can make up for it, which is something that has been a problem over the very, very many years, although it has improved. Um, one thing that is improving that is co- uh, that has cost a lot of uh, fees historically has been the layers of the payment system. And what we're really noticing now is a lot of the middlemen are getting cut out. So if you think about what it takes to charge a credit card for crypto, you have the centralized crypto exchange, which is a liquidity provider. Um, you have a payment processing company, uh, and then you probably have the fiat on and off ramp, which is connecting the two together. And then you have the wallet provider, which is actually like the user interface, like the one that you don't, you don't replace that. The user has to interface with all of this, right? All this backend technology. Um, we're noticing that the three, primarily three, but there's sometimes even more layers underneath are starting to consolidate where the liquidity provider, which may be the centralized exchange or the payment processor may be cutting out the fiat on-ramp API provider, like, like the, like the simplexes, um, or the, the simplex and the moon pays might be taking over some of the payment processing and they become a payment processor themselves. Um, or the liquidity provider becomes a payment processor or all three get collapsed, thereby reducing the fees by a lot. Um, And this is a trend that we are noticing just in the past year, year and a half. And so we expect that what you're, you know, rightfully complaining about as far as like the fees being high are going to start to shrink down and still allow the benefit of being in a single app and not having to deposit withdraw um, and having all of that happen in one. And realize shockingly, even with admittedly the fees being a bit higher, um, a lot of people happily choose to to go that route because in a way it's more convenient and a lot faster to go through a centralized exchange is a multi-step process, all right? So you're you're doing the self-custody app, you're creating the account in the exchange, you're still doing KYC, but you're depositing into the exchange, waiting for that fiat to clear, making a trade, and then waiting for the exchange to allow you to withdraw, or many of them don't allow you to withdraw immediately. You know, you do that in something like Edge, sure, it might take a day, Usually it takes minutes, might take a day, but your hands off during that period of time, you're not having to do anything. So admittedly you have a rightful complaint and it's one that I like really, really want to improve. And we're seeing strong um, changes in industry that are going to improve that where they're going to make going to directly to a CFI exchange, um, barely, barely worth your time. So then going back to the, to, to, to the edge product then, like how does that, how does that, you know, that journey from my end, from the user journey, like you know, I place the order for the crypto, like, how, like, you know, I put in my credit card information, it gets routed to, we're not, we're not going through a centralized exchange, but I assume you're, you're using one of these payment providers. Like how to, like, maybe just talk through like the flow of like, you know, mm-hmm. we, we talked about this just kind of roadblock of, of, of 
how, how this all routes through the CFI exchanges, but like how, what's the alternative for you when, when, if I'm using an app like yours? Yeah. So in edge specifically, there's kind of two routes, crypto to crypto versus fiat crypto in the fiat crypto route. Um, if you're using Apple pay, Google pay, uh, credit cards, whatnot, um, that goes through a specific route where we actually best price hunt across currently three, um, partners and the ones you had mentioned, MoonPay, simplex, and another, and a third called Banksa. Um, they basically compete on best price. Once a quote is given, you can see exactly what you're going to get on that quote of say Bitcoin to, you know, I'm sorry, uh, that dollars to Bitcoin, Canadian dollars to Bitcoin, Euro to Bitcoin. Um, and if you execute that quote, you then launch into, uh, an interface for that specific provider where they may or may not do some level of KYC and you provide card info and then you execute the order. And usually within minutes, crypto shows up and it shows up such that you actually have the crypto it isn't like it's an edge and you can't withdraw it. And so that's one of the core differences. The money shows up and is usable instantly, right? Just pending a confirmation on, on chain. Um, and it does some level of best price hunting across at least these different providers. Um, we, we do have other payment methods supported. They may not go through one of those providers. Uh, they may go through other ones that are specific to different regions. We partner with one called Bits of Gold for Israeli shekel, you know, which is fairly nuanced, not, not one that many different um, companies support. Um, faster payments in the UK, so also supported by Banksa. Um, so there's other companies that we partner with. And I think we have more support than most other companies in the in the industry because we are very partnership heavy. Um, and then we offer cell functionality functionality as well, where people can off ramp through some of these partners. And the user journey is similar. Um, you specify, you get a quote for how much you want to sell. You go into a widget, which then you know starts to execute the the sell operation, do KYC if necessary. Um, in other countries, the sell operation is much smoother than currently in the U.S. We have an integration with MoonPay, but it's, you know, it's not ideal in the sense that you're presented at the end of the, of the process, you're presented with an amount and an address to send money to, but you have to copy and paste that amount. Um, with our other partners, it just launches Edge and you just slide to confirm. It sends out the crypto and then your bank gets credited. We are about to, to launch some other integrations um, that will let people sell crypto in minutes in the U.S., and not have to deal with the copy paste. It'll just be like, oh, here's how much Bitcoin you're going to send out. And here's how much dollars you're going to receive. Slide to confirm. Boom, your bank gets it in a few minutes. Um, that'll be the end user experience we're always shooting for. Um, but note that, yeah, just like you mentioned, there's different providers to cover different payment methods in different regions. Um, longer term, what we aim to do to smooth out that user experience is to do similar to a password manager. I mentioned how Edge is kind of like a password manager, but for keys and all of your encrypted data. Um, Edge can also store encrypted KYC information, you know, personal information, name, address, email, you know, even credit card info, just like you know, a password manager would, or no one sees it but the Edge end user, but we can automatically submit that to the different exchange partners. Um, that way, doing KYC with you know, more than one exchange partner becomes much easier, as opposed to having to fill out the info, you just have to confirm it, right? Information's mm. already sent there, and you just say, "Yep, that's what I want to use." Click, and you're done. Right. That's, so you wouldn't necessarily that's kind of have to. So you wouldn't necessarily have to go to, you know, like six different exchanges and go through KYC on every single exchange. But it would almost be like the KYC would, in a sense, come through the wallet essentially, or it would, the the wallet would, would basically through, yeah. it would come through. It would come through Edge, and it would basically be verifying with the exchange that hey, this is this is a you know verified yeah. consumer. The exchange might still have to verify your, your info, but you wouldn't have to enter it. That's kind of our goal. Got it. And Got with, it. with deeper integrations, we may even be able to send over a verified KYC token that was received from one exchange to another. So that's the end goal. And I think that's the, the, the direction industry is facing where you may not even know or care what exchange is, is you know, actually fulfilling the order, right? They just get mm. a tokenized KYC, which they don't even see your info. They just see a tokenized version of it. Um, and they happen to be the best price, then they can fulfill that payment method, order gets executed. And so that I think is the absolute future of crypto where these fiat rails exist, but they're like ISPs. No one really cares about them. Like, hey, do you care about, right. you know, what ISP? I don't know. I have no idea what ISP you're using. I don't care what ISP you're using. I'm, you probably don't care what I'm using, right? At the end of the day, we have internet access. Um, and fundamentally, I think that's what we'll be that's what the experience will be like with crypto is you'll have a bunch of ISPs that are on-ramping us to crypto, but what are the things that we'll really care about? We'll care about what wallets are we using, what DeFi protocols are we 
are we using, you know, what, what products are, are we taking out loans? Are we trading that at the end of the day are kind of like the websites of the internet. They're the Yahoo's, the Facebook's of the internet. And who cares if it's a Verizon that's connecting us? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good analogy. And I've always kind of thought of, of, of like, you know, the best analogy for a wallet in a, it is almost like to a, it's like a, it's like a browser, right? It's basically kind of like your portal to this world of web three. Um, I, th I used to think that, and I actually think that it's more than the browser. It's the, hmm. it's actually the website. Oh, it's actually the um, site itself. Interesting. It's okay. the site itself. So today it's today, I think in the, in the web three landscape, it's the browser in a sense that you launch the website of what app you want to interface with, right? Like you launch like uniswap.com or you launch ave.com, you know, or name whatever DAP. And mm -hmm. then the wallet is kind of the browser that lets you sign transactions. Right. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that I prove right on this because I don't like that user experience and I think it's not fundamentally adoptable by the masses. It also has major security implications. As you can see why a lot of people are getting fished by fake websites, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And I think fundamentally instead, the, the, the wallet is the app that has the functionality that we're looking for. Like, do I, I want to take out loans? I go to an app that might focus on, focus on loans. So I want to trade. Great. Do I go, do I want to send and receive and want pay, do I want payments? I use that app. And that's not the app that then launch, like that launches the other app as a browser interface. It's both clunky and less secure. Um, so I know that in yeah. this day and age, the big dApps and DeFi protocols and whatnot, um, they don't want to be bothered with also writing a wallet and having to deal with key management security and whatnot. So they, they basically delegate that out to like the MetaMasks and Wallet Connect. Um, but I think going forward, the DeFi and DApp protocols and Web3 apps that prove themselves as being valuable, the protocols that prove themselves as being va valuable will end up having native apps that connect to them and you don't have to go through the separate like key manager. That, that's a predict prediction I have and that I hope rings true because it, it makes for such a better user experience uh, as a whole. Interesting. Um, and so it's, uh, it's my hope that that's the direction we go. And we kind of see that now because think about Uniswap. Yeah, you can go to uniswap.com. You can also access it directly from a bunch of wallets, including MetaMask. Right, right. right that, that's how you know a protocol has kind of made it, is its core feature um, makes it directly into the apps that ha that hold the keys. Because then the UX is 10x better. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. No, it's interesting. I, I, I'll admit I haven't really considered this uh, alternate future that you're describing here, but I, I mean, so I'm, I'm kind of processing up here, but no, that, that, that does make a lot of sense that this would be perhaps like a better alternative to what, to what, uh, kind of what we have with me. So I, 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 you know, I, 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 one of the things I kind of actually like about, about MetaMask is that it is, it does kind of feel like it's like, like it's giving your own kind of personal login. It's like, it's sort of replacing my, just like wallet, you know, my, 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 you know, email password logins to all these different websites, but it's like, okay, you just log in with your keys. And, and you that's a others. valid app too. And that's, that's a, that's a valid app that holds your keys to do yeah. authentication. Like, like an app that sits as a, as a browser extension that can authenticate that holds keys maybe just for authentication, not for cryptocurrency is super valuable. And I think that we should go in that direction, but that, that, that app, isn't necessarily one that goes and signs cryptocurrency transactions for an arbitrary website. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that arbitrary website isn't how we access some functionality such as taking out loans. You know, instead there's a very targeted like loan app and hopefully a more native where I don't deal with browser URLs and the, the security of the web interface um, right. th that I'm having to trust that that is how I then access that specific application, especially in like, like social network type application. It'd be nice to have like a native app, especially on mobile too. On mobile, it's yeah. terrible having to do, deal with a key manager app and then the website. You know, if it's it's like, why do that? And I can have like Twitter, the native app, right? Right, so right, might right. as well have the native app, the native Web3 app itself. So I guess one last question for you here is, at, at this day and age, in 2023, almost 2024 now, like what's the business model for a wallet at this point in time? Right. Like what's like, how are you guys making money here? What's your, what's kind of your, I guess your end game? Um, you know, like what's, what's the, what's the business strategy here? In many ways, it's not too different than the web two world, right? You could take multiple, you can make, you could take multiple paths in the web two world. What's, what's the business strategy of a website? This question was asked back in the nineties. 
which is why the big dot com boom and then everyone sold off. They realized they, they thought that, oh my God, websites have no way of earning money, right? <laughs> Pets.com, I can just go into a pet store. Um, news site, why, you know, how are they going to, how are they going to get me to pay money when, you know, uh, I could just click on any little news site. You just go buy so a you newspaper. Go, you, you can buy a newspaper. You, you can, so basically the two routes, you can um, get eyeballs and sell advertising or actually sell a product. And those, those methods still work in the wallet space. So you can just have a whole bunch of eyeballs and put ads on the bottom if you wanted to do that. Right, that that is a a model, and I think some actually do that. Um, you can charge fees for a service. Right, you can sell the product if the product is compelling enough and it's unique enough. You say, hey, you know, pay me five bucks a month to be able to use this app that gives you some unique, compelling um, interface to access this aspect of the cryptocurrency world. All those models definitively exist. The current one, because cryptocurrency has it doesn't have a broad use case yet. Its use case is speculative, so therefore it's trading. That's where the biggest companies are on is trading. So that is the use case right now, and therefore that's how all of the apps monetize, whether you're centralized, decentralized, self-custody, you know, custodial, which is you charge on the trading, whether it be fiat on and off ramp or crypto to crypto. So by and large, yes, that is, that is the monetization model. It's not different. Now, once crypto and Web3 start to branch out and have different use cases than purely trading, then you could start to look at different models. Um, once payments come into play, sure, you could take a slice of payments. Right? That is a, po a potential model. Lightning Network right now, um, we have a potential monetization model where we share the fees for routing Lightning payments with an LSP. That's a monetization model not too unlike what we see inside the traditional financial world, except that now you don't have a monopoly that says, well, you have to go through our servers. Like you could choose a different LSP. So it's similar financial model except that it's much more competitive because it's an open protocol mm. and that's what we're excited about and uh, i am i accept the fact that the industry i'm in if successful will make it such that we as a company and not, and same with all the companies that we work with and that exist could never be as big as the existing financial services companies like you, know, you can't be as big as a jp morgan you can't be as big as a wells fargo you can't be as big as you name whatever financial service company and I'm okay with that because I'd rather have thousands of companies that split the market cap of the five biggest banks because that means we've we've succeeded, right? If we end up with just yeah. five gigantic crypto companies that are the size of JP Morgan, Wells Fargo, and whatnot, HSBC, then we failed, right? There's no point in that. I don't want to become as big as JP Morgan. I want there to be a thousand of us, and but we still want to be one of the thousand top, the, the top thousand, right? And so... Um, that is the model. Like, I think the model isn't as drastically different than people think, especially in, in the, the software space. I call it the, the self-custody interface wallet space, but it is still one that can be quite lucrative and uh, successful. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah, I think I think that that this future that you, this this sort of dystopian future where uh, you know financial service companies continue just like aggregate and we continue to consolidate. Um, I do kind of worry that like, it seems like at the, the pace things are going in the U S we might end up with this situation where it's basically just like Coinbase as a, you know, a, the only way you can really buy an access Coinbase, Coinbase basically just becomes like a bank. Right. And that's mm -hmm. like kind of the, everything's kind of ring fenced around them. There's not every, all the competition has either been like driven offshore by the sec or something. And you basically just have Coinbase as like another kind of Wall Street institution of some sort. That's, yeah. you know, they just they're maybe their core competencies in crypto, but they're basically kind of the same, you know, same sort of models what we have in traditional finance right now. Um, I think that's definitely, I guess, probably not something Satoshi would have would have envisioned uh, or would have hoped for uh, that this would where this would all end up. But but there does seem to be a lot of forces pushing things in that direction right now. Um, there are. But, um... The one hope is that the, the underlying layer that all these companies are built on is still open. Yes. And so that's not true of the current financial rails. So, so long as that stays open, um, there will be an option for people to download open source software and transact on Bitcoin, ETH, and whatever they want. It might be yeah. harder. It might be harder to download that software. It might not be available on the app stores. You might have to literally go to like a GitHub or whatever and hit a button and compile it. But just that availability in and of itself helps hinder the ability for some of these companies to truly grow because if they act too poorly, people will resort to taking the hard route and installing this open source software. 
All right. Like at some point you, you put enough friction and enough burden on people, they'll, they'll go the harder route and bypass you. So that's the one check and balance that we do have is the, so long as the protocol stays open, um, we're not going to have JP Morgan's in the crypto world. Well, great. Well, um, Paul, really appreciate your time here. Um, been a really great conversation. We probably could have kept going on for a bit longer here, but, um, you know, really enjoyed having you on here and just want to kind of turn it over to you for any final thoughts. Um, I've been asking people lately, like, you know, just given the state of the market, it's not very positive right now. Uh, it yeah. hasn't been positive for a while, but like, I mean, what are you most excited about? Like, where do you, where are you seeing optimism? Maybe other people are, are a bit pessimistic or what's kind of keeping you excited about like getting up every day and continuing to build during this, this tough season right now. Yeah, so two aspects have gotten me pretty excited over the past couple of years. One is DeFi as a whole, um, and then the second is privacy. And they're two very different, though. Like DeFi, admittedly, kind of compromises a lot of privacy. Um, so privacy in the protocols that, you know, some of the top pro privacy protocols like, like Zcash, for sure, definitely Zcash, um, and in many ways Monero as well. The improvements in usability in the privacy layer have really gone up. To the point where sometimes you don't even care, or you don't go through, you go through zero extra effort to get the privacy. And that to me is, is is really important, and I believe in that from the viewpoint of like whether the price goes up or down of that asset, it just empowers the people that need it, and even and to put it into the hands of the people that don't. That to me excites me about cryptocurrency, and we put a ton of effort into supporting privacy protocols, way more than I think we receive in in return from the viewpoint of like ROI, but it's just part of our our blood. Um, and the second is DeFi because it opened my eyes to the fact that there are existing centralized services that can just be completely replaced with mm. a, a self-custody autonomous, you know, you own your funds alternative. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't convinced that was possible back when it was kind of like the Bitcoin only world. I'm like, oh, Bitcoin only great. We can send and receive at any time we need to do any kind of like trading, um, hedging, uh, you know, loans, whatnot. It was always through a centralized company. And so seeing a fully... Um, uh, a full implementation of a company's product in in DeFi really excites me um, because I think that is what I call uh, our industry taking off another layer of the financial stack. You know, people talk about technology stack a lot, operating system, you know, web server, that kind of thing, um, user interface. Well, the financial system has a stack too with like money being the base layer and Bitcoin takes mm -hmm. care of that. But then now you have layers on top of that, hedging, trading, um, you know, loans, lending, earning. Now we're slicing away at more layers of the stack, giving people less reason to use the traditional financial system and more using more reason to use crypto. And so that will onboard, I think, more people than uh, than what we had with just basic payments. So those two those two nuggets keep me pretty excited. Um, and uh, why well, I'm always stat ecstatic to go to work and why the day goes by just like this. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Uh, no, really well said. Um, I mean, I definitely agree with those two. I mean, I think DeFi, uh, even though I've been a bit, bit disappointed in DeFi in the last probably six to 12 months, I feel like the pace of innovation seems to have kind of come to a very slow halt. There's not, we haven't had any like U Aves or Uniswaps or compounds or, you know, it seems like people are just kind of recreating stuff on new chains, on new L2 chains that are popping up, just redeploying the same app on a new chain kind of thing. Not really... There's yeah. not really, I haven't, I haven't really seen anything that gets me excited about DeFi lately, but, um, but the original primitives, they work, they're still there. Um, they haven't been killed off yet by centralized authorities. So that's, they haven't been killed off, but I think one thing that makes me excited is they haven't been mass utilized yet. Yeah. So that, that's the next yeah. step is not like, let's create some new primitive that we haven't thought of as being possible on DeFi. It's like, let's take these great primitives that, that do exist now and get them in the hands of more than 0.01% of the world, right? Like actually using them directly. Yeah. Like we're like, we're probably 0.01% of the world that yeah. can truly use these primitives. I want to get that to at least like 1%. Right, right. That'd and, be a big win. Know, and then you're, then you're going to see the liquidity and prices, ex, you know, just absolutely be in our favor, right? Just, it'll just explode liquidity, prices drop. And so that to me is, I think, what, what excites me is um, less something new, but take whatever we already have and then I'll really drive it. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, well, great. Well, Paul, really great having you on the show here. How can folks get best get in touch with you or your team if they're looking to to learn more? Um, easiest place is probably our website, edge.app. 
Um, you can get links to our social on there. Uh, you'll see me on the website, including links to my social accounts, you know, Twitter. I don't think I'm on Instagram though. So pretty much just Twitter. <laughs> That's the primary one. Um, and definitely please reach out, send us any feedback, try the app. Um, as well, if you happen to be in the San Diego area, um, I'm in our office over here and we have, you know, about a quarter of our office's event space where we host meetups. We're really big on like in-person meetups. We invite people to come out. We host usually about one per month, um, from different groups, you know, uh, around the tech community. We'll have a JavaScript meetup here early next month. So go to our website. It also shows the events that we're, we're hosting for other groups. We don't necessarily run the event but we host them. It's just a community service we give to the community because that's how our company came together is through an in-person meetup group. So we want to give back in that sense. Um, but yeah, edge.app, that's pretty much the best way and uh, hope to hear from everyone through there. Cool. Great. Well, thanks so much, Paul. And thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you next time on DWeb Decoded.